Welcome to workshop 6. Today we're going to be discussing binary exploitation. In today's workshop, we're going to cover various topics like binary exploitation, registers and stack, buffer overflows, and format string attacks. Let's start off by understanding what the word exploit means. And I take this definition from the Pico Primer, but an exploit in simple words is an attack on a computer program. If a computer program has a vulnerability, a hacker can take advantage of such a vulnerability to make the program do something different from the original purpose of the program. And taking advantage of a vulnerable vulnerability successfully is called an exploit. And binary and exploitation involves taking advantage of a bug or a vulnerability in order to cause unintended or unanticipated behavior in the problem. Now, for binary exploitation problems, we really need to understand how the memory in a computer works, and more specifically, what the registers and stack do and how they work. So let's take a look at this, the registers. What do the registers do? Well, registers hold temporary data that is needed by the CPU to execute instructions. They also perform operations and they store resulting data. Registers only hold a small amount of data, um, so 64-bit architecture CPUs hold 64 bits of data per register and 32-bit architecture CPUs hold 32 bits of data per register. And the CPU architecture determines the design of the processor, instructions that are supported, size of registers, and other factors that we will not get into that's out of side of scope for this workshop. Here we have our general purpose registers from EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ECI, and EDI. Um, and then we also have our stack pointer and base pointer. So EAX to EDX is usually where the data is stored. The higher bits are called the A, are represented by the H, and the lower eight bits are represented by the L for each register. The stack pointer, also known as the ESP, is the current position of data or address within the program stack. So it's wherever you know the whatever is con currently being executed. The base pointer or the EBP is the frame pointer. It contains the base address address of the function's frame. So it's going to tell the memory here is where the register is in the memory. And the instruction pointer EIP holds the address of next instruction to be executed. So that's what visually a register may look like. Now let's talk about the stack. So a stack is a reserved area of memory used to store temporary variables created by each function, including the main function. And we take a look at some of the problems and some of the, pro uh, the programs that are written in the C language, we're going to see the use of the main function. All x86 architectures use a stack as a temporary storage area in RAM that allows the processor to quickly store and retrieve data in memory. The higher memory addresses are at the top of the stack. So what happens is that the stack follows a LIFO method, which is last in, first out. And items that are pushed on top of the stack are popped off first. We can take a look at this example as a stack of plates. So when you're stacking plates on top of the other, usually the plate on top is the plate that gets taken off first. The same thing happens with the stack is whatever goes on top is also popped off first. So it's important to note that data is stored in little endian method. So for example, if we're taking a look at a hexadecimal address of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, just as an example, it would not be stored as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It would be stored as seven, eight, five, six, three, four, and twelve in the stack. In 32-bit registers, memory addresses um, of registers are four bytes apart. So by using a base pointer, the return address will always be EBP plus four. And the first parameter will always be at EBP plus eight, which is shown in this diagram to the right. We see where it says function parameter number one, and it says that's EBP plus eight and function parameter plus number two is going to be EBP plus 12. And the first local variable will always be at EBP minus four, 
it says where it says local variable number one. This isn't too important to know for this one, but this will be important for the reverse engineering workshop. Let's talk about buffer overflows, which are commonly seen in binary exploitation problems. Buffer overflows are violation of memory security. A buffer is a specific area of memory that an application has access to to hold temporary data. When an application receives more input than it expects, a buffer overflow occurs. Buffer overflows allow access to memory locations beyond the application's buffer, resulting in the program crashing. And what can happen is this allows an attacker to inject their malicious code into this area of the memory. So for example, let's take a look at this password program. This program accepts a password. And so if your password is longer than eight bytes, what would happen is the remaining bytes would go into the adjacent areas of memory. So now how an attacker can use this is if an attacker understands how memory and binary works and they can craft a code. Oftentimes this code is known as shell code. That code can be interpreted by the computer and then executed. If it overflows into an instruction, the computer might begin to execute it. Many programs that are written in C and C++ and other languages are susceptible to these attacks due to dangerous functions. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So what happens is they lack built-in protection against accessing data anywhere in memory space. And they don't automatically check whether input of data is within its bounds. And when that occurs, a buffer overflow happens. Let's take a look at this diagram. So here we have, you know, your stack, your a regular stack. And in here, we have room to put where it says char C12. We have room to put in, let's say, 12 characters in there. Now what happens is, what if an attacker knows exactly where the address, where the return address is in the stack? What could happen is that they could write code to overwrite the return address. So as we can see in this diagram in the third picture, the attacker has overwritten the return address, which now goes to the location specified. And at that location specified is the their code and it executes the code that they wanted to do. And this code could be anything and really they could perform whatever code they've written, whatever they wanted to do. This is very, very dangerous. As, and as you can see, this is one of the problems with not, you know, validating the input that is being allowed for users to input. So let's take a look at some of these dangerous C functions. Um, so these are some of the dangerous C functions. What happens is uh, usually they don't really do bounds checking or they don't really allow for checking user input. And that can result in unexpected things that shouldn't be happening. Or if someone like an attacker has access to them, they can make things that the program is not supposed to do, you know, happen. So one of the things we're going to talk about is a format string vulnerability or format string attack. And one of the most um, you know, popular functions that goes along with that vulnerability is the printf function. So let's take a look at what a format string attack exactly is. And this is taken from the OWASP website. So the format string exploit occurs when the submitted data of an input string is evaluated as a command by the application. So whatever input you put, and it could be a code, the application would execute that. And in this way, the attacker could execute code, read the stack, or cause a segmentation fault in running the application, which causes new behaviors and which would essentially compromise the security or stability of the system. The format function is an anti-C conversion function, and some of this might not make sense, but as you practice through the problems, it will become more clear exactly how this works. Attack could be executed when the attack application doesn't properly validate the submitted input. So now we're going to take a look at an example from Pico CTF, which is going to deal with the format string attack. So I'm going to be focusing now on the stonks problem under the binary exploitation section. So what the problem says is I decided to try something no one else has before. I made a bot to automatically trade stonks for me using AI and machine learning. I wouldn't believe it if you told me it's sick, it's unsecure. 
So we know that there might be a vulnerability in the program. And the program is called vulnerable vuln.c, so it's written in C. And we have to connect um, to it using netcat. The hints are, okay, maybe I'd believe you if you find my API key. So um, let's take a look at this vulnc program. So basically, if we take a look at this program, we go all the way to the end, what's going to happen is that this program is going to ask us what we want to do. Do we want to buy stocks or view portfolio? And if we further investigate the program, let's take a look at the buy stocks function right here. Right here. So we could see that the says flag buffer print flag file not found so we know that we need to use this function so that we can print out the flag file or print out the flag and um, if you look at the um, if you look at it it's going to give us an opportunity to put in an API key when it asks us what is your API token and right over here it asks us for some user input and as you could see, the user input is not being validated, so it will allow us to put anything. And if it allows us to put anything, maybe we can input some characters to read off other places in the memory and get to where the flag is located. So let's try that. Let's go back to the problem. So for this problem, we're going to have to connect to the web shell and we're going to have to connect um, to this port using netcat and c stands for netcat so first it's going to ask us to log in using our username and password so let's do that you just reconnect And once we're connected, I'm just going to clear the terminal to make it easier to read. I will, um, maybe it's easier to read this way. So I'm going to connect to netcat. And again, we're here with the function. So it, we know that we're going to have to select number one. So let's see what happens. What is your API token? So let's just give it an X just for now and see what happens. I noticed right here is that it gives me, you know, it gives me some of this information, but right here I put next and it's giving me a hexadecimal memory address. It's giving me value. So something tells me that we're able to, with our input, you know, look at other areas of memory. So let's try this function again. Let's connect to this program again using netcat. Oops. And let's buy some stongs. It says, "What is your API token?" Actually, let me um, let me just clear this screen. Let me just clear this so that we have a better view of it. So let's connect to Netcat again, and let's put one buy some stongs. And this time, let's see if we can overflow it. Let's see if we can overwrite whatever area it is and go to the place in the stack where we can actually view the file or the flag. So let's just put a bunch of X's. And now I noticed that right over here, we have this value and that looks like hexadecimal. So let's go back and use a hex to ASCII converter. And I talked about this resource last time, which was rapid table. So let's just input this hex and convert it to ASCII. Now, if you look carefully, you notice that we do have our flag, Pico CTF, right here. And if you recall, in stack, usually everything is, you know, in little endian mode. So what we have to do is we'd have to reverse this. So it, instead of it being like this, it's going to be CTF 
sorry, PICO, and then this part, CTF, and we're gonna have to do that to all of that. And once we convert it from little endian, then we're gonna have our, our flag in normal format. So once you do that, you're gonna have your flag. So that was how we got to the solution of this problem, stonks. So that was the end of the workshop for today. Here are some resources for additional help with understanding some of these binary exploitation problems as they can be very tricky. I encourage everybody to watch last year's workshop on binary exploitation 101 and 201 because we went into a lot of detail about some of these problems and how to solve them. So I really encourage everybody to really view those presentations. Just a reminder to ensure that you have registered for the competition for CanHack 2022, and we'll see you in next week's workshop. Thank you.